Thousands of RSA fellows work in public services, and at this time of austerity, we have a putative network of senior fellows leaving the public sector, not all of them voluntarily, um, who want to explore how they can continue to apply their skills and commitment for the public good. Last year, I saw the publication of the RSA 2020 Commission on the Future of Public Services, a report which called for reform to be judged on the criterion of social productivity. That is, the capacity of public services to enable us better to meet our own individual and collective needs. So having hosted the Prime Minister for a major speech on public service reform earlier this year, we are delighted to be hosting this important and highly topical speech by the Leader of the Opposition, focusing on NHS reform. Over the next few months, I'm going to be talking about education and other public services. But today I'm here to talk about the National Health Service. This is unusual in one sense because leaders are sometimes accustomed to giving panoramic public service reform speeches, and indeed the Prime Minister gave one here three months ago. But I think getting the NHS right is so important, it should demand the full attention of leaders, and preferably before, not after, they realise their policy is somewhat half-baked. The, the NHS is vital to the well-being of our nation. It is a genuinely world-leading healthcare system based on principles of fairness, one of the proudest institutions of our country. If it was proposed today, we would be told it couldn't be done. And yet the NHS was built at the time of a serious financial deficit after the Second World War as Britain rose to the task of rebuilding itself. The NHS is an institution which each generation has a responsibility to pass on in a better condition than it found it, what I call the promise of Britain. And in my view, it is under threat from the Conservative-led government's reorganisation. Let me say at the outset of this debate that I come to it as a reformer of the state as well as the market. It is particularly incumbent on those who believe in public services to be always seeking to make them better. My conviction stems in part from my own experiences and the experiences of my constituents in, in Doncaster North, my constituency. Because I see both the liberating power of public services, but I also see the daily frustrations people can often face from unresponsive services or services that are letting them down. An accountable public sector, just like an accountable private sector, is integral to creating a fairer Britain. My argument today is that to do that, to create a better health service, change will be essential. The new pressures on the NHS are too great, the new challenge is too large for us to think that simply the status quo will be enough. The choice for the NHS is not, as the Prime Minister suggests, between change and no change, it is a choice about what kind of change we should have. My case is that we need change which upholds the values of the NHS and makes it work in the era in which we live. I believe the government's changes will undermine the values of the NHS and make it harder to meet the challenges of the future. I want to base my account on the future for the NHS on three critical lessons that I believe we should learn from Labour's record in government, which I think point to the right path for future change. First, change is successful where it is driven by a clear focus on the current and future challenges that the NHS faces. Second, change in the NHS works best where it strengthens accountability and makes the NHS more answerable to patients. And third, whilst reform requires sometimes difficult and unpopular choices, it is only successful if it protects the sense of national mission and the values of cohesion and collaboration, which I think are central to the National Health Service. Let's look back to 1997. We inherited an NHS in dire straits. It was an institution that was profoundly valued, yes, but it was also seen as being in steady and some believed irreversible decline. It is easy to forget that today. 13 years on, 14 years on, investment and reform did transform the service. Two facts stand out above all others. The verdict of the public 
At a time when people talk about cynicism in our public life, the NHS is now benefiting from the highest satisfaction ratings it has ever achieved at 72% against the lowest ever in the 1990s. And then there is the verdict of experts. The Commonwealth Fund have recently shown that the NHS to be, is one of the world's leading healthcare systems for quality and value for money. What are the lessons we should take from this success? The first lesson is that change worked because it came from a clear-eyed focus on the reality of the situation we inherited. In the late 1990s, waiting times were unacceptably high and stubbornly rising. Standards were low and there was little sense they could be turned around. Patients too often felt like they were an inconvenience, not the reason services were there. Cast your mind back, John Major's government had looked long and hard at the idea of setting a maximum waiting time for treatment of 18 months. 18 months, a year and a half, and decided it was too difficult. Even some on the left were arguing that charging was unavoidable. Labour's response was to meet this challenge head on. The one-less review led to the refinancing of healthcare through the increase in national insurance. The NHS plan took decisive action to challenge the legacy of long waiting times. All, all the changes were aimed at the central challenges of getting patients access to treatment they had previously struggled to get. Second, changes work best where they strengthened accountability. In the 1990s, the government was embarrassed about the state of the NHS, but the citizen had no set of standards to call upon. People were abandoned for hours on hospital trolleys, others sat for an entire night in A&E, and some were asked to wait weeks for a GP appointment. This was partly about underinvestment, but it was not only about underinvestment. The NHS today is more accountable to patients at every level. That was the goal of reforms like targets and later waiting time guarantees, which created clear rights for patients. It was the goal behind the introduction of greater choice of hospital and appointment, as well as personal budgets for those with chronic diseases. Although we shouldn't pretend choice is the only thing that people care about in the NHS, and I don't believe it myself, it can make a real difference for those frustrated with the system. And greater accountability was achieved by foundation trusts and payment by results, making NHS management more accountable for, for performance. So in my view, accountability was strengthened. But that doesn't mean every reform worked. Some reforms were badly executed. The GP contract changes, for example, failed precisely because they reduced rather than enhanced the accountability of GPs to their patients for evening and weekend opening although later reforms did make up some of the ground. Other reforms, and we should be candid about this, underestimated the disruption that was created from change. The frequent reorganisation of the size and shape of primary care trusts, frankly, did not take sufficient account of the costs and problems they caused. In fact, David Cameron, rightly in my view, decried top-down reorganisations before the general election. It's both surprising and disappointing that he hasn't remembered that lesson. Overall, there can be no question that on the last decade, the picture was one of success. And this insight that accountability is key should be central to any strategy for change in the future. The third lesson I take is that whilst reform requires tough choices, it will be successful only if it protects the sense of national mission. The values of cohesion and collaboration that I talked about at the outset that underpin the NHS and the efforts of those who work in it. If you go back to the founding of the NHS after the Second World War, it didn't just change the method of payment. It also transformed both the culture in which healthcare was delivered and doctors' relationship with their patients. Abolishing the requirement to pay for care made a huge difference to patients. But we must also recognize it made a huge difference to clinicians as well and their relationships with each other. It encouraged collaboration. The author who has written a lot about healthcare and other public services, Julian Legrand, talks about the knights and knaves of the public sector, talking about different motivations, the motivations to make money, the motivations to help people. He is right that we must not be naive about the public realm. The state, if it isn't accountable, can sometimes stand in the way of the interests of those who depend on it. But if it is a mistake to be glib about all public servants, it is an even bigger mistake to be cynical about their motives to serve. 
one of the great assets of our NHS over some other healthcare systems is that this is an institution which fosters a sense of common endeavour and nobility of purpose. Just a small anecdote, on a train recently, four medical students came up to me expressing deep distress about what was happening uh, in the National uh, Health Service. And their concern wasn't about money, it wasn't about whether they would get a good job in the NHS, it was about the undermining of the values and sense of mission of the health service. So I believe our reforms work best when they strengthen the ability of those who work in the NHS, including those young people I met on the train, to serve people in need. Any effective reform must ensure collaboration, a central part of the NHS, continues alongside the right kind of competition. And it must strengthen the NHS ethos, not destroy it. The idea of binding the NHS together in a framework of values focused on the patient was behind the establishment by the last Labour government of an NHS constitution. And it is why, as we look forward to the future, we must be mindful of the impact which changes can have on the culture and ways of working which we've always taken for granted. So it's on the basis of these three lessons from our past that I want to judge the proposals that the government has come forward with. Now, it has to be said, there is considerable confusion, as far as I can see, not least within the government, about why they've embarked on this costly reorganisation at a time when funding is so tight. What it seems to me, if you look at the bill and you look at what government ministers and others have said, is that there is a belief that they can shift the NHS towards what I can only describe as a free market model of healthcare provision, albeit one without the extension of charging. That seems to be the underlying ideological force behind the changes that they are putting forward. The fragmentation of commissioning into hundreds of small GP consortia, the removal of financial protections on foundation trust, uh, on foundation trust and indeed the idea that foundation trust could go bust, the abolition of private patient caps, and a regulator to provide competition at every level in the NHS where UK and EU competition law will for the first time be right, applied right across the health service. I have to say, I don't believe this plan represents a serious response to the lessons of the last 13 years, nor a credible response to the challenges of the future. It is a year zero approach to the reform of the NHS, which I believe is ideological and reckless. The shift towards free market healthcare will not in any sense help the NHS prepare for the challenges it will face in the future. An ageing population and rising chronic disease both demand an NHS which can prevent disease and where there can be earlier intervention. Given these challenges, the big task is to get family doctors and hospitals to work more closely together. But the government's plans risk setting GP against hospitals in the battle for profits and patients and who provides care. Given the challenge of an ageing society, a central task is to get GPs and social care for the elderly working more closely together. But the government's plan risks fragmenting services into hundreds of GP consortia, each with an uncertain financial future. Everything we know from around the world suggests free markets don't work in planning efficient healthcare systems. Demand for services is less well managed and cost pressures rise. Now the Prime Minister likes to say we need better cancer survival rates and who could disagree with him. But he's given us no clue as to why his reorganisation will help make that happen. When judged as a plan to prepare the NHS for the next decade, Mr Cameron's proposals are at best irrelevant and at worst deeply unhelpful to the kind of integrated care we need. Second, what about strengthening patient focus and accountability? They're actually abandoning many of the waiting time guarantees and that takes power away from patients. And the bill offers only the vaguest answers to the question of what happens if your GP consortium, which is making decisions about the money that is spent, wants to restrict your choice or your standard of care as a patient. The bill proposes that the adoption of the recommendations of NICE, the regulator, optional for GPs, which means that guarantees about the type of treatment as well as speed are further undermined. And equally of concern to me is the uncertainty about the accountability of how NHS money will be spent. It is right to involve GPs more in the commissioning of services. But this was being done within the current system and could have been enhanced. 
there is little reason to believe that the wholesale transfer of £80 billion of public money to GPs will enhance accountability, and some reasons, at least, to believe it will be reduced. Labour did use the private sector to deliver services for NHS patients. But these proposals take us into a whole different arena, with the prospect of private sector companies being used to carry out the commissioning of services. Decisions about which services are available, when and to whom, may slip swiftly into the hands of private companies. Thirdly, I fear that rather than strengthening the values that I talked about, that underpin our NHS, that those medical students talked to me about, the proposed changes risk squeezing out collaboration and common endeavour. I asked David Cameron a few weeks ago about the clauses of his bill dealing with competition and comp EU competition law. He seemed slightly surprised uh, that that was what was being proposed. I, I still honestly don't believe that enough people understand the potential implications uh, of the bill and its proposals on competition. Because what it envisages is the same regime for healthcare in Britain as we have for the privatised utilities in water, gas uh, and energy. Now, that might be right for the privatised utilities, but do we want healthcare, even free at the point of need, to be run on the same basis as the privatised utilities? It, for example, let me give you an example. It is right that the big six energy companies don't collude with each other on decisions about price, for example. We don't want them talking to each other and setting their prices. But is that our view about how we think hospitals should be run? Is that our view about the NHS? Not in my view. As the King's Fund has said, this bill signals a shift towards a more competitive market for healthcare. While we support increased competition in areas where it demonstrates benefits to patients, the bill appears to move towards promoting competition at the expense of collaboration and integration. Now, what would the defenders say to my argument? They would say that if NHS hospitals can prove that collaboration is in the interests of patients, they will be allowed to do it. Now, is that a convincing argument? Frankly, I don't think it is. The value of collaboration in our National Health Service is too important for it to be reduced to something you have to prove is sensible to a bureaucrat in a regulatory authority, which is what the bill proposes. I really worry that little thought has been given to the environment in which our doctors, nurses and clinicians will be asked to work once the NHS has a duty to promote competition at every level and competition law is the preeminent basis for running healthcare. So on grounds that it doesn't meet the challenges of the future, that it weakens rather than strengthens accountability and it threatens the ethos of the health service, these changes are simply wrong. What's more, I might add, this is a proposal that nobody voted for. None of us should forget how before the election, David Cameron explicitly and repeatedly promised there will be no top-down reorganisation of the NHS. Now we read in the newspapers that horse trading is taking place between the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats about what to do about this bill. We have contradictory briefings, it's hard to keep up hour by hour, frankly. We have contradictory briefings to the newspapers from Tory sources, Treasury sources, Health Department sources, Liberal Democrat sources uh, as well, all blaming each other. Each day just adds to the sense of utter confusion and chaos about a bill that I would remind you has already completed its committee stage in the House of Commons. This is bad government. This is not how the future of our health service should be determined. And frankly, it is an insult to the people who work in the health service, many of whose jobs depend on the changes that are being proposed. It is an insult also to the people who use the health service. It is too important for its future to be determined in a backroom deal which would then be bounced on MPs with precious little scope for proper debate, let alone consultation. Today we hear that apparently the answer is going to be delay. But slowing down a bad bill is not the answer. That's why I say this today to Mr Cameron. Go away and think again. Don't come back with piecemeal changes. It's a bad bill built on bad assumptions and bad ideology. If the plan to reorganise the NHS is going to be significantly changed, and it must be, let any new plan be the subject of a new white paper and a new national consultation. And because the NHS is so important, I make this offer. If there is a genuine attempt to address the weaknesses of the reorganisation,
then my party will enter into the debate with an open mind, accepting that any NHS plan must be delivered within a tight spending settlement. While satisfaction is the highest ever, there are huge challenges that the NHS faces, and they must be addressed. And I want Labour's plans to be written not in some secret negotiation and then presented without a mandate, but in dialogue with patients and professionals. Let me briefly move that debate forward. First, the biggest challenge the NHS faces in the future is how to respond to an increasingly elderly population with far higher levels of chronic disease, as I said at the outset. Our response to this must be a decisive move to a more preventative service. This is essential not just for better outcomes, but for the better use of public money. And it is essential to tackling the gross health inequalities that exist in our country. Family doctors should be expanding their role in helping people understand the risks that they face, managing diseases and live healthier lives as we grow older. Some of the best examples of this kind of care come out of patient-led groups and patient-to-patient -patient monitoring. So actually in the future, healthcare is not just about your trip, visit to see the patient, it is also about the benefit you can get from talking to and having dialogue with other patients who are facing similar chronic conditions. Public trust in our NHS actually makes it extraordinarily well-placed to deliver such a shift in care. Let me just give you one example of what I mean. Cancer survival can be dramatically improved with early diagnosis. That requires better screening and faster testing, but also getting those who need to be tested into a clinic. That is a challenge as much for those outside the NHS uh, as for those within it. And that is the challenge of the future. But I don't believe the distraction of a massive bureaucratic reorganisation will help it happen. The second big challenge is mental health. Improving services for these patients would have a profound impact on the well-being of tens, possibly hundreds of thousands, many of whom never come into contact with the NHS or only come into contact very late in their illness. As well as being devastating for, for individuals and families affected, mental ill health can be a cause of people falling out of work and losing their homes. Again, this is about how we prevent the costs of illness from cascading into other areas, which is what happens with untreated mental health issues. When I look at what the last Labour government achieved in hospital care, I think the next Labour government will need to complete a similar transformation of mental health care. The third challenge is how we deal with social care for the elderly. As currently constituted, and I think we all know this from our experience in our own lives, provision will struggle to meet needs in the future. If unreformed, this will pile immense pressures on our NHS and further erode our aspiration to be a fairer country. All of us should look forward to a secure old age with the certainty of knowing care will be there when we need it. So we must focus on the future challenges the NHS faces, and I don't think a bureaucratic reorganisation is going to come anywhere close to doing that. This is about how patients exercise more control over their own care. There are 15 million people in this country with chronic diseases. They should be in front of a GP discussing their care and whether an individual budget would help them. Accountability also comes from patients being clear about what they're entitled to. In my view, rather than eroding them, we should look at how we can strengthen a small number of national guarantees and entitlements. In 1997, the NHS couldn't offer enforceable national standards because the service was too poor. Today, because of what we've achieved, we are closer to that possibility. And stronger patient entitlements, in my view, should sit alongside stronger local accountability. Too often, necessary change in the NHS is held back by the sense that local people fear losing out to the decisions of an unaccountable system. The right response is to share the difficult decisions with patients and the public. I know the NHS would be better and stronger if such decisions were made with local communities through real accountability. As we meet future challenges, we must always protect the ethos of the National Health Service. It is not good enough to pretend that because reform is unpopular, it must be right, as this government is doing. Difficult decisions are necessary, but the thrust of reform must maintain what people value in the NHS. All of us have our own personal experiences of, our, of the NHS. It is a great British institution and one we need to preserve and renew for the next generation. I want my kids to be as proud of the NHS as I am. The question we face now as a country is not change or no change. We need to protect the NHS and to do so we need to change it. Labour governments have never stopped doing that.
and John Healy and I, our Shadow Health Secretary, will carry on arguing for the right sort of change. It is my ambition to lead a government which takes the next steps in that process of change. But as we debate the government's proposals for the NHS, we must learn the lessons of the past and we must properly address the challenges of the future. I'm interested in your account of the role that markets should play in the public uh, sector. And if you feel, as it were, you're developing a, a new position, or whether it's a continuation of the past position, particularly in relation to the health service, but, but more broadly, what is your perspective on the way in which the Labour Party should think about markets and public services? When you think about something like healthcare, and I think it goes back to what I said in my opening, it, it is different from the energy sector or the water or water companies, that there are certain characteristics of the health service, both to do with efficiency and the values, and relatedly actually, the values underlying it, which are in danger of being squeezed out by simply a free market approach, even if it is still free at the point of use. And I don't say that out of sentimentality. I say that out of belief about what makes for an efficient and effective uh, service. And, you know, I think that is why these proposals are extremely uh, dangerous. That doesn't mean to say that the private sector can't be used in certain circumstances in the health service as we have done it. But it does mean to say that you have to be very, very clear about how you preserve the character and ethos of the service. And actually, look, I think, the, just to take it more broadly, I think the interesting thing is that our position is sort of evolving in, in a number of ways because if you think about some of the arguments of the early part of the 2000s, there was a view taken that sort of markets on their own, if you like, would serve us well in the economy. Whereas actually, the financial crisis teaches us a lesson about the right form and the right role for government regulation to actually make sure that markets do serve us properly and don't veer out of control. So look, I think there are limits in relation to the use of markets in relation to public services, uh, particularly the NHS. I think you've got to judge them service by service. And, and I, think, uh, you know, I think it is really important to, to always, in the decisions you make, preserve the character of a service. And I think that applies to the NHS, uh, but also to other public services as well.